In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to this program entitled, Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. In the last segment, we spoke of the concept in Louisa, Louisa Picaretta's writings of light. That is how God engenders eternal light in the soul through his divine act, in the singular, divine act, operating in our human, finite acts, thereby rendering them one with his eternal act. And how this light, the light of grace that God engenders within us through his one eternal act, impacts all creatures of the past, present, and future. Now, before I go any farther, I would like to emphasize that. The gift of living in the divine will is a gift. It's something we take for granted in the expression, gift of living in the divine will. It's not a virtue. That means it does not depend upon human effort or achievement. No saint, no matter how holy or great, including the Blessed Virgin Mary, could obtain this gift by human effort. Not even the humanity of Jesus Christ could obtain this gift by his human effort. For this gift is purely divine. It is from a supernatural being, not a human creature, like the humanity of Christ or the humanity of Mary or our, our humanity. And by virtue of this divine providence or origin, it can only be given from above, from a source that transcends all human propensity. Christ illustrates this many times in Louisa's writings, telling her that had his divine will not been the motive force behind everything he did in his human nature, his human nature would not have redeemed the whole world. But only a few generations. Now, the reason why Christ says his humanity would only have redeemed if people from a few generations if his humanity was the motive force and not the divine will behind his redemptive acts is because human nature is limited to the moment it's conceived to the moment it dies. Its acts are not retroactive nor proactive. They're only contained to the timeline in which that human nature exists. So, Christ's human nature, much like ours, spans several generations only. You are alive, for example, at the same time your parents are alive. That's two generations right there. At the same time your grandparents are alive. That's three generations. At the same time your grandchildren and nephews and nieces are alive. That's maybe five or six generations. So therefore, Christ tells Luisa Picaretta that Divine will was the motive force behind his acts of redemption, thereby redeeming the whole human race and all human acts, and indeed all creation. You can find this passage if you're curious to know where it's reiterated, and it's found in volume 14 on June 15th, 1922. Jesus says, if it were not for the prodigy of my supreme will, my redemption itself would have not extended to every individual, but would have been limited, extending only to a few, to only a few generations. So the divine will is really the concept before, behind the light that our acts, when united with God's one eternal act, engender. Um, our lacks engender light. Now, I want to pass from the theme of the light of grace infused within us by virtue of God's supernatural assistance and one eternal act, which render our divine acts universal, impacting all the universe, from this theme to the theme of redoing or reenacting that which Jesus did in his humanity which will lead us to the theme of our 
redoing and reenacting within ourselves all that which Christ did, thereby impacting all things. So to make it simple, look at it this way. God, who is eternal, embraces all things of eternity, including time and space and all creatures therein. That's simple. God is omnipresent. Now, when we live in God's divine will, we acquire by virtue of God's largesse this omnipresence as well. We don't do it. God is doing it in us. It's a gift. It's not a virtue. So, God is the one who is operating in us. Even in the most insignificant and menial tasks of life. Conscious and unconscious. Indeed, Jesus tells Louisa, even when we sleep, our breaths, our heartbeat, the lifeblood circulating within us, all these motions within us, even at a microscopic level, are sustained, guided, elevated, divinized, multiplied, amplified, universalized, supernaturalized by God, who is 24-7 residing within us by virtue of his real life. The same presence of Christ in the Eucharist is present in the soul who lives in the divine will. Therefore, just as Christ is 24-7 present in a piece of bread and wine that have no rationality, but that are nonetheless sacred by virtue of the priest's consecration, so the Trinity is 24-7 present in the soul who lives in his divine will in a greater way than in the Eucharist and in the wine, that have no rationality or volition, as we do. doesn't mean, what I'm saying, that we replace the Eucharist, that we are greater than the Eucharist. No, because the Eucharist is God. We are not God. Rather, the presence of God is greater than us in the Eucharist inasmuch as it is active. It is receptive. We can say yes or no to God. The bread or wine cannot. And therefore, it is more meritorious. So there's a difference between the presence in the Eucharist and the activity in the Eucharist. God can be more active in us than he can be active in the host. But his presence is greater in the Eucharist in as much as it is God himself, who is body, blood, soul, and divinity present there. The Eucharist, therefore, is God. We, when God's presence is in us, are, do not become God. This is not a New Age theology. Rather, as in the consecration of the bread and wine, Christ replaces the substance of the bread and wine without replacing their accidents their taste, touch, smell. They remain bread and wine on the outside, but the underlying, immaterial, invisible substance that keeps that bread together in its form, that keeps the wine together and maintains its accidental form and taste and image is nonetheless God, none, none other than God himself. Okay, Now in us, God is present. In the same way, just as he maintains the accidents, the external appearance, smell, taste, touch of bread and wine, while replacing the substance thereof, he is present in the soul, maintaining our creaturehood, our human person, just as he maintains the bread and the wine, while replacing within us, as in the host, And the spirit, the human spirit with the divine spirit. Pope John Paul II speaks about the distinction of the body, soul, and spirit in his theology of the body. And the spirit, the human spirit, when it is divinized in God, becomes one with God's Holy Spirit. This is also in the writings of the venerable 
Concepcion Cabrera de Armida. Jesus tells her that when this mystical incarnation takes place in the soul, which is in essence the same thing of God transforming the soul into his will, the human spirit becomes one with God's divine spirit. This is actually what Jesus refers to in Luke's writings as the transconsecration of the soul in God. We call it transubstantiation of the bread when Christ becomes the Eucharist. That's the word used by a bishop of France. He invented really that word transubstantiation, a bishop of France. And then Thomas Aquinas adopted and popularized it in a summa. And then, of course, Trent adopted it as well and made it the codified expression of what takes place, you know, the dynamism that occurs at the moment of the consecration of the bread and wine. In the writings of St. Faustina Kowalska, we find the word transconsecration, which is identical to transubstantiation in a way, in as much as God does not replace the bread and wine in us, but he replaces our human spirit with his own divine spirit, thereby establishing a real life of God in the soul. Now, apart from this theology, let's get back to redoing and reenacting the finite human acts we perform in God's divine will. Who redoes these acts? And what are these acts that are being redone? And two, who reenacts them? And what is being reenacted? Well, let's start with redoing acts. There's a big misconception out there. And this is why I chose to address this theme. In my 25 years of international travels throughout the world and preaching the divine will to all the seven seas and the continents throughout the world. By the way, I have over 4 million flyer miles with one airline company from preaching the divine will. That doesn't count the other airline companies over the past 25 years. I remember one year I took about 200 flights in one year. That's equivalent to a flight a day for seven days. I'm sorry, for seven months. But that was about, I don't know, 14 years ago or so. And um, the only reason I mention this is because the divine will is very active. It's very universal. And it's very, yet at the same time, unchanging. When one sets out to perform an act in God's divine will or share the teachings of the knowledge of these acts. The human effort has really nothing to do with the achievement that is accomplished in its effort. God is the one behind everything the human person does, provided the human person allows God to act within it. And the task at hand is to allow Christ, specifically the second person of the Holy Trinity, the same person present in the Eucharist and the wine, and that wants to be present in our souls through a transconsecration of sorts, to act within us in such a way that we do what Christ did in his humanity. Take, for example, what is found in Volume 21 on March 16th, 19th, and 27 of Louise's volume, where Jesus tells her, I represented the new Adam, who was not only to provide the remedies with which to save them all souls, but who was to redo and restore what the old Adam had lost. This is why it was necessary for me to take on a human nature, in order to enclose within me what souls had lost and through my same humanity give it back again. So Christ here says he represented the new Adam who was not only to provide the remedies with which to save them, meaning all souls, but he was to redo. Now, what does he mean by redo? Does he mean that he's going back into the past of those acts that were done by humans before him? Yes, it does. Okay, so what does that entail? That Christ is taking over their actions in real time, and doing them for these people? The answer is no. Not in the literal sense of the word. Remember, Christ never imposes his will upon any creature that's rational. Never. He leaves the free human will in the battleground of redemption, whereby 
forging on the anvil of sweat, blood, and tears its own decision-making process through deliberation, reflection, counsel. It obtains merit or demerit. The soul has to work out its own decisions in life by its own free will choices. Christ cannot take over that deliberation or that decision-making process for us. So when Christ is redoing souls' acts of the past, he's not taking over their mind. He's not taking over their free will and forcing his will upon theirs to make them go to heaven. No, that's not what redoing means. And many people have this wrong understanding of acts redone in the divine will as being precisely that. That is, that Christ can go into the past and redo everyone's will acts above and above, above and beyond their free will. That's not the case at all. Rather, the concept of redoing means that Christ is before the Father and for the Father's glory by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in him, going into the past and reordering those acts that were done poorly by individuals' free will choices, who are either in hell for all eternity, who are either in purgatory, or who are either in heaven. That had to get there through purgatory. If they went straight to heaven, their acts do not have to be redone because they were perfectly ordered. Okay? But rather... Christ is, in this case, reordering, perfecting in his own humanity, not in their humanity, you see. Their humanity cannot be intruded, cannot be interfered with. They have a free will that God always respects. But Christ is redoing within his own humanity what others in their respective humanities had done imperfectly, poorly, or, or uh, irreversibly grave, where they were... Their acts led them to hell. Now, what about those who did their acts perfectly, that went straight to heaven? Very few people go straight to heaven, according to the writings of the saints. Most go through purgatory, to heaven. Well, can these be redone by Christ? Yes, but not in the sense of reordering them, because they were perfectly ordered. But rather, he is adorning them with his own qualities, and thereby conferring upon them in heaven an increase of accidental glory. Now, an increase of accidental glory, of course, means that we are giving to the saints in heaven that which they cannot by their own merits attain. Remember, once a soul dies, once a body dies, and the soul goes to heaven or hell or purgatory, there is no more merit or demerit. They're confirmed for all eternity in the life they lived on earth. The time of merit is over. So, they depend entirely, 100% upon the souls on earth to increase in accidental glory at a greater rate than that which their earthly life enabled them to do. See, in heaven there's a progression in holiness. It's not a stagnant, irreformable, immobile place. On the contrary, it's a dynamic place where the souls are constantly growing in intimacy and knowledge through a greater and greater participation in the light, the grace, the presence of God. But we on earth can accelerate their increased accidental glory. This is exemplified in the writings of Louisa when she was with Jesus, and wanted to offer up her communion on behalf of her namesake, St. Aloysius de Gonzaga, whose feast we celebrated about four days ago. And she offered up her communion that day on his behalf. And um, she increased his accidental glory, so much so that it overflowed for the betterment of all creatures in heaven. And this is found, this is found in volume 26 on June 7th, sorry, June 27th, 1929, if you want to read that at your leisure. Um, 
Now, what is accidental glory? I don't want to go into great detail about this, but it's something that is not mentioned in great detail by the church. The church does not give a whole lot of attention to it. But we can, yes, increase the accidental glory of creatures. You know, think of, for example, the moniker of Saint Aloysius de, I'm sorry, Saint, um, um, this, uh, the, it's coming, now I'm looking at a passage here, that's what's distracting me momentarily, that I'm going to quote to you, the moniker of, found it, okay, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, this is his moniker, Ad Maiorum De Gloriam in Latin. To the greater glory of God. Now, what does that mean? Why would anyone say to the greater glory of God if God's glory is insufficient in and of itself? How could you give God greater glory? But we can. To the greater glory of God. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, he established this as the cornerstone of his spirituality, of the Society of Jesus. And this is found all throughout the writings of Louisa, giving God greater glory. All throughout Louisa's writings. It's very Ignatian in many respects. For Louisa, in doing her rounds, is render greater, rendering greater glory to creation. And by increasing the glory of the angels and the saints and all other creatures, God is in turn glorified more as well. Louisa and Ignatius convey the purpose for which man was created and through which he rediscovers his primordial place in the order of creation. Louisa emphasizes on the soul's call to offer God greater glory. Louisa emphasizes this call of the soul many times throughout her writings. Let's look for example, just take a few, where she wants to give God greater glory. Does this mean increase God's glory, essential glory? No. Does it mean increase his accidental glory? Yes, but, in, un, but we have to understand what accidental glory means. Okay? So, um, take for example, volume 12, May 22nd, 1919. Jesus tells Louisa, What some souls do not offer me, I take from others in whom I redouble the graces that others reject from me. And from these I receive double glory and double love and glory. There it is. Jesus says in black and white, he receives double glory from some souls than from others. So that means <laughs> that we can, yes, give God greater glory. This is, what the, con this is the concept of accident, increasing the accidental glory of God. You know, it's, it's not a very clearly defined expression accidental glory but we know that god's essential glory and our essential glory can never change never this is exclusive to the individual we determine our own essential glory no one can increase or decrease that except us but we can vicariously impact their accidental glory and this accidental glory again is reflected in that passage of march 23rd 1931 um no let me make sure. No, I'm sorry. That was May 22nd, 1919, Volume 12. And we also find this in Louisa's, that is, increase, no, I don't want to use the word increase God's glory because we may think increasing is essential glory, which we can never do, but rather giving God greater glory. And this is also found in Volume 36, November 13th, 1938. Jesus tells Louisa, it behooves you to know that acts done in our will are inseparable from us. They are our greatest glory. Our greatest glory, not our, just our glory. And all creatures of heaven see in them our divine lives multiplied for as many times as they were accomplished in our will. And we can increase the accidental glory of creatures as well. This is found in volume 12, February 20th, 1919. As well as in Volume 14, April 29th, 1922. And um, here Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, have you seen with how much love I am at play and direct the acts done in my will, 
Each one of these acts contains a divine life. That is why, at the touch of these acts, all created things feel the life of their creator. They feel once again the strength of that omnipotent fiat that brought them into existence, and they make merry. Thus, these acts constitute new glory and new festivity for all creation. Is that not increasing the glory of creation? Of course it is. And um, the list goes on. In fact, we could even increase um, the glory of Jesus in the Eucharist. Just read, for example, volume 31, November 13th, 1932, and on and on. So back to redoing the acts in the divine will. When we speak of this concept of redoing acts, it is first and foremost Jesus Christ who began to redo the acts of creatures. He was the very first one with Mary. Okay, Mary was the first creature conceived in sin, but he was the first creature to ever do it. On, in volume 12, January 29, 1919, Jesus reveals, we have now arrived at approximately the third 2,000 years since creation, and there will be a third renewal. This is the reason for the general confusion, which is nothing other than the preparation of the third renewal. I will manifest how my divine will cooperated with my human will, how everything remained linked within me, how I did and redid everything, and how even each thought of every soul was redone by me and sealed with my divine will. Okay, how did Christ redo everything in every soul? How did he redo every thought and seal it within his own will? This is how, in a very unnoticeable way, without any fanfare, and in very in a very concealed manner. And I share this message many times with you. It's taken from volume 11, October 14th, 1912. Jesus relates, When I was on earth, did my hands not lower themselves to work the wood, hammer the nails, help my putative father Joseph? While I was doing this with my own hands and fingers, I created souls. Right there, stop. Did you get that? While I was doing these things, what things? Menial chores at the house, like you, doing dishes, sweeping the floor. With my own hands and fingers, I created souls. While calling others back to life, I divinized and sanctified all human activity, imparting divine merit to each human action. In the movements of my fingers, I called into sequence all the movements of your fingers and those of others, imparting to them the merit of my own life. By lowering myself to these little and lowly actions that men do in their daily lives, I formed a small divine little coin of incalculable value and made it flow through all human actions. So here the Lord is telling us how we, like him, can redo all the acts of all humans before us. Now, obviously, we cannot redo actions of humans not yet conceived, because that is not, re we would have to take the re out of that and just saying we're doing it for them, right? Or we can use the word redo, but in, with the understanding that these acts have yet to be accomplished in real time and space, and that once they are accomplished in real time and space, our acts proactively influence them. So the concept of Christ redoing is a very simple approach in its application. Whatever we do in life, everything we do in life, in fact, we can unite it with our intention to all the acts of all humans that were performed just as we were doing them. Someone once asked me, wait a minute, back 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, they were not driving cars. So if I'm driving my car, how can I unite that with the acts of Adam and Eve? 
or they were not, let's say, sipping on cappuccinos, or let's say, illi, or espresso, or lavazza, or medaglia d'oro, all these fine, robusta bean Italian coffees. They did not exist, perhaps, 3,000 years ago before the Romans existed. <laughs> but the point is the same. It's not a literal doing the actions of the other people. They do their own actions, right? Christ does not literally take over the human person's body and act on their behalf. He's re reenacting, redoing within his own humanity, not their humanity, his own, through his own actions, not their actions, what they accomplished in life. So, for example, Suppose you want to help a person who's dying from famine in Cambodia or in um, Zimbabwe or in a very impoverished area of Africa or even in Bangladesh. And you cannot literally help them. Yes, you may send some monetary offerings and do it wisely knowing that the money will go to the people it's intended for because there's a big racket in some of these countries that intercepts money. So you have to ensure you're sending it to the right sources. But you cannot physically help this person be alleviated from their hunger. So what do you do? You may fast and offer up your fasting for them. And God, in an invisible way, to your own unawares, without the light of faith, it's to your own unawares, will administer grace to that person or even persons around them to assist them in their hunger. Good Samaritans may be inspired by your fast to help that person. You see, Mary told us at Medjugorje that prayer and fasting can avert war and suspend natural laws. Imagine that. Much more can it help alleviate a person from hunger. Okay, so we have to be mindful that there is this invisible world surrounding us, all around us, that is more forceful, more real than the visible world in which we live. So just as we can, I don't want to use the word simulate, but rather assimilate with a person in need. So we can, with our acts, assimilate with a person 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago in their need. This is the whole principle behind redoing the acts of others. We unite whatever acts we're doing with everything they did in the body. So even if we're driving a car, when they didn't have cars back then, that action of us driving a car is applied to whatever acts they did in virtue of our intentionality. Intentionality cannot be underemphasized when it comes to redoing acts in the divine will. It's the absolute quintessential ingredient for redoing acts in order for the acts to be redone in the divine will. Without the intention, we cannot redo acts in the divine will. There has to be an intention. Louise and Jesus expressed intentions all the time in the divine will. Did not Jesus said, I pray for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail? Well, he was praying specifically for Peter. Some people are of the mistaken impression that in the divine will, there are no intentions. So we just walk around almost like bathing in the air of neutrality, immune from everyone's need and suffering, just praying in the divine will, doing our acts. That's not living in the divine will properly. Yes, we can do our acts in the divine will in a general way where we're offering everything for everyone. And that's fine. But throughout life, God will put people in our lives that will elicit specific prayers, whether it's a dying person, whether it's a person who's injured, whether it's a person who's in a crisis, a health crisis, a financial crisis. They will approach us and ask us for prayers. Or we will get news from others that they need prayers. And what loving person will turn their back on that and say, no, I don't have to offer up any intention in the divine will. I'll just pray for all creation. That seems a little bit indifferent to the person's needs. Louisa, she prayed specifically for her mother who was in purgatory. So do you think it would have been charitable for Louisa to say to her mother, no, you don't need my prayers. I'm praying for everyone all equally in the universe. 
We can do that, yes, again. But we must also be attentive to the motions and inspirations of God when they come to us. So if God places within our heart the need to pray for this specific intention, let's say to stop a law that's being enacted in Italy, like right now, that will make it a crime for anyone to speak against immoral sexual acts of people in, that are transgender or gay, then we should do that. We should pray that this law is repelled. In fact, the Vatican, a few days ago, has forcefully opposed it, the first time in the history of the Vatican, that the Vatican has opposed this, that's this pending Italian law that will make it a crime for anyone to speak against immoral acts of gays and transgenders. So, this means that people can go to jail or prison for doing so, and this is, this is horrible. If we get to this point in the world, what is there left but God's fiery wrath to purge the whole earth? Imagine if children are being taught this in their curriculums, in, their, in the elementary schools, and we cannot oppose it. So, remember what the apostles said after they were flogged by the Sanhedrin and told not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. What did they say? Better to obey God than men. And that is our dictum in life. We must always stand up all right, like children of light and fight the good fight, speaking the truth in love and not being faint-hearted or pusillanimous, but rather being strong and courageous, speaking the truth always in love. So we are asked by God to redo the acts of all creatures of all centuries and being attentive to the inspirations God places in our heart, praying for the needs of specific times and places, On October 19th, 1922, in volume 14, Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, my humanity lived as though in the center of the eternal Son of my will. And as it descended, it ascended again into its center in one single act, carrying all human acts within itself to redo and reorder them according to my will, the will of my Father. Now all this happens in the soul who lives in the center of my will. It embraces everyone and no one escapes. It's a, it acts for all and omits nothing. Together with me, the soul diffuses itself to the right and to the left, to the front and to the back, but in a simple and natural way. And as it operates in my will, the soul accomplishes by the power of my will the round of all centuries, and it raises its act above all human acts in a divine manner. So just as Christ reenacted, redid, reordered all human acts, we are called to do the same. How do we do it? Like Christ did it, in a very simple and natural way, by sweeping, by working the word with a hammer, in the menial chores of life, by uniting our intention with God's one divine will, and with the with the redoing and reordering of all acts of the past. Carrying all human acts within our souls in order to redo, reorder, and sanctify them. Knowing that as God, it is God who is doing this with us. In volume 12 on February 2nd, 1921, Jesus reveals, my daughter, surely in my will there is the creative power. Billions and billions of stars came out from one single fiat. It is the fiat that acts. Therefore, you too can say in my omnipotent fiat, I want to generate such love, adoration, blessings, and glory to my God as to compensate for everyone and everything. This, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is redoing acts in the divine will. We are compensating for their acts done poorly. We're not taking over their human activity, controlling their free will and acting for them. We cannot read, 
do literally what they've already done in time and space. But we can compensate for their poor actions. That's what we doing is. So that all of their acts that they fail to do that should have been ordered to God are done by us. You see, the purpose of creating Adam and Eve in God's mind was so that Adam and Eve could deposit within their respective human wills all the thoughts, words, and actions of all their progeny. This was the purpose of Adam and Eve's nature. They were made in God's image and likeness in order to deposit within their will, the womb of the Trinity, as it were, every thought, action, and word of every human being that would come from their loins. Well, our role in the divine will is identical to that of Adam and Eve. We are to do the same. And this is the concept behind redoing our acts in the divine will. We are compensating, making reparation, redoing, reordering, giving God the glory that was not given him by these poor actions. This is the dynamism behind redoing acts. So it's not like some people have it shared with me, which is we literally do their acts for them so that they don't go to hell. No, we cannot do that. They've done their own acts all for once and for all eternity. There's no going back. And their judgment pronounced at the moment of their death, no one can change. Nobody. But what we can do, as St. Padre Pio put it, is pray for them now as if they were alive. And one person asked Padre Pio when he said, I'm praying for my great-grandfather who is dead. The person said to Padre Pio, how can you do that? He's already dead. Padre Pio said, I know, but God is applying my prayers today. God has, is applying my prayers to him today while yet he was alive. So in other words, with time there is no, with God there is no time. So you can pray for your ancestors. Why? Because when they were alive, 100, 200, 300, thousands of years ago, our prayers, not yet said in time or space, because we were not yet conceived, God had foreseen from eternity and has already applied them to them, you see. This is the mystery of God's eternity that goes beyond time or space. And the same thing applies to us. Right now, the souls who are not yet conceived and that will be conceived in time and space and will live in the divine will, even during the era of peace, for example, when the divine will reign on earth, they will pray for us today, even though we're dead. And right now we are experiencing to our unawares, our bodies experiencing, our souls experiencing, maybe not our minds, their prayers, even though they're not yet born. This is the mystery of God's eternity. And this is what Padre Pios told this man when he was asked, why are you praying for your great-grandfather? He said, because God is applying my prayers now to him when he was alive. So this is how we re help redo, or rather pray for people in the past, knowing that with God, nothing is impossible. But again, remember, the free human will we can never impose upon. So even though we may pray for a person in the past, in real time, and even though we may redo their acts without acting for them, but rather compensating for them, we can never control their free will. And this explains why certain souls go to hell despite the prayers of souls in the divine will, including Jesus Christ. Look at Judas Iscariot. At least two times in the hours of the Passion, Jesus tells Louisa he was lost. He's lost for all eternity, even though Christ prayed for him in the divine will, even though Christ pleaded for him in the divine will. All right? Now, when we do our rounds in the divine will, we're not doing rounds so much as a quantitative act, but a qualitative act of bilocation. The soul bilocates in the rounds in which we pray. So we pray in the rounds of the sun and of the stars and of the earth and of the skies, the waters, the creatures therein, the thoughts of all humans, the steps of all humans, the breaths of all, etc. 
You see, the reason for this is because God's eternal act within us embraces all creation in every moment. And the soul need not linearly and chronologically enumerate all the acts of all creatures. To do so would require as many lifetimes as there are creatures to redo numerically the acts of all creatures God calls into existence. And this is impossible. But rather, having fused ourselves in the divine will, our soul cooperates with God's one eternal act that embraces all creation in one instant. See, God's will that has neither beginning nor end precedes the soul's acts. And the soul's acts precede the lives of the acts of Adam and Eve and of all other souls to plead and make reparation on their behalf. So when I say the soul's acts precede the lives of the acts of Adam and Eve, what I'm saying is our soul, when praying, that's an act. Our desire is an act. This can go back to the Garden of Eden, even before Adam committed sin. Louisa did this. In one of her volumes, she goes into the Garden of Eden and makes reparation for the sin that Adam is about to make or perform. So before original sin, Louise is disposing Adam for the act of contrition. In this sense, Louisa helped redeem Adam with Jesus, helped dispose Adam for repentance. She's a co-redeemer like Mary in this sense. And the more the soul repeats and renders continuous its rounds of God in, in God and in creation, the more it qualitatively embraces and unifies and glorifies all things in him, in heaven and on earth, while growing in holiness. See, the repetition of the soul's acts in the rounds for the betterment of creation invariably impacts its own spiritual growth. Okay, I want to pause here and remind you to continue to support this wonderful program of Radio Maria, this wonderful broadcast that offers to you many programs on the faith in different fields of theology, spirituality, catechesis, etc. So continue to be generous in your prayers and in your monetary donations. Now, with when it comes to reenacting, we must remember that Jesus Christ was the first one to reenact. He tells Louisa, and speaking of the hours of the Passion, if that if his humanity lived in the Father's eternal will and embraced the acts of all humans, the soul that piously meditates the hours reenacts what Jesus did during his mortal life and what he does in the most blessed sacrament. Take, for example, volume 11, October 1914. These hours, he relates, are the most precious of all because they are the reenactment of what I did in the course of my mortal life and what I continue to do in the most blessed sacrament. So not only do we redo soul's actions of the past, of the present, and even of the future, we may say, but we can assimilate within ourselves Jesus' passion and in so doing reenact what he did in the course of his entire mortal life from conception till his death on the cross. And not only that, the soul progressively embraces the acts of all creatures of all centuries. This is found in volume 14, October 19, 1922. Jesus relates, all of this happens for the soul who lives in the, in the center of my will. It embraces everyone and no one escapes it. It acts on behalf of everyone and omits no one. Together with me, the soul diffuses itself to the right and to the left. It precedes and it follows everyone's acts. It precedes and follows everyone's acts, but in a simple and natural way. So the soul's assimilation engenders a sort of fusion with Jesus' humanity who restores to creation's God's divine harmony. This is found in volume 12, May 16th, 1917. He tells Louisa, these hours are the order of the universe. The hours of the passion are the order of the universe. They put heaven and earth in harmony and restrain me from sending to the world to ruin. 
So this is important, you know, when we are redoing and reenacting the acts of Christ and of other creatures, we don't redo Christ's acts. No, that's impossible. And Christ's acts require no redoing at all. They're perfect and complete. But rather, we reenact what Christ did. We redo people's poor actions, but we reenact Christ's actions. See the difference? So as we reenact Christ's actions by meditating on his passion, we we help maintain the order of the universe, put heaven and earth in harmony, and restrain God from sending the world to ruin because of its sins. Here the soul co-redeems with Christ in an eternal dimension between heaven and earth that embraces all creatures of the past, present, and future. And this place between heaven and earth is described by Christ in volume 12, June 10th, 1920, when he tells her, My daughter, when my humanity lived on earth, it lived suspended halfway between heaven and earth. Having the entire earth beneath me and all heaven above me, by living this way I drew all of heaven and earth to me and united them as one. Now the one whom I call to my likeness, I place in the same conditions in which I placed my own humanity. All right, we'll continue from this moment. My time is up, my brothers and sisters in Christ. May God bless you and strengthen you in your resolve to remain faithful to the teachings of Christ and Scripture, to oppose the secular pagan laws that are being enacted in our society, but to do so with love. Remember what Paul says in his letter letter to the Ephesians, preach the truth in love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.